I got some farm fresh roasted goose and I'm gonna show you how to make it. As Vermont's largest commercial goose farmer, there is one question I get asked more than any other. And that question is, why don't my geese fly away from the farm? You see, as teenagers, farm geese never quite develop the wing muscles they need to carry those large farm fattened bodies that they have. And so they can never quite fly more than a couple of feet. But the second most often question I get when people find out I'm a goose farmer is, they want me to show them how I cook a goose. All right, let's stop wasting time and get right down to business. Now right here is an example of one of our geese. This goose was harvested last month here on our farm. It was actually a Toulouse goose, led a good life. Now a very first and important step here is to weigh your goose because if you don't know how much your goose weighs, you won't know how long to cook your goose. Usually the smaller geese that we harvest end up here on the farm and the bigger geese are the ones that we sell to folks. You might notice that there's still a feather or two in place here. We do our best to pluck the geese here on our farm after the bird has been dispatched and bled out. What we'll typically do is scald it in a tub of hot water and then we'll put it in a chicken plucker which is this big washing machine type device that spins the bird around and removes the feathers. But whenever you're working with ducks or geese or any other type of waterfowl, they're always very difficult to pluck. And so what we'll do is once we've plucked the bird, we'll dunk it in a tub of hot wax. That hot wax will then be cooled. And much like we're giving a bikini wax, we just rip those feathers right off. But now what we're gonna do is take our bird, put it down on the cutting board, very carefully cut open the plastic bag. Plunk it down here. With a lot of waterfowl, what you're gonna always have is some extra fat. So I usually go in there and just kind of pull out that extra fat. Something really magical happens when you roast root vegetables in duck or goose fat, and so you wanna save that. We're gonna be using it for some of our side dishes. I'm gonna actually cut the back out of this bird and do something known as spatchcocking. Spatchcocking happens when you remove the spine of the bird so that it can lay flat. Once you've done that, you can put it down into your roasting pan and it's gonna cook much more evenly. And so I'm a big fan of not doing doing like the traditional whole roasted bird, but rather removing the back and spatchcocking. Now, when you're spatchcocking a bird, you can use a really sharp knife, but it's actually been my experience that a good pair of kitchen shears works just much better and it's just a lot easier. So you flip the bird over face down. You just go right through here. You clip, 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 clip. It's like you're cutting a piece of tin or something. I will usually set the back of the bird aside and when I go to make stock with the bird later, I will always use this as a core part of that stock. I always try to ensure I have a couple of jars of either chicken or duck or goose stock in our refrigerator. It's super easy to make. All you have to do is take leftover bones, toss it in a crock pot for 12 to 18 hours, and it comes out thick and rich and gelatinous. And it basically becomes the secret ingredient for any type of cooking you're doing around the house. Or sometimes I like to add it to the meals of my very large white farm dogs. <laughs> Here on our farm, we subscribe to the one bad day philosophy, where we try to give the animals the best possible lives that they can have until that very final day when they are slaughtered for meat. In my opinion, that's a really important part of ethical animal consumption, whether it be meat or animal byproducts like eggs. Now I'm busting out my handy dandy kitchen scale, as well as my bowl, let's tear for the bowl, onion powder and garlic powder blend, a couple healthy scoops of that. A lot of people might debate me on this, but I'm a big fan of doing my measure by weight instead of by volume. Then I like to bust out with some paprika. Now this is a seasoning that's gonna surprise folks, but I also like to use a good healthy dose of about six or seven ground cloves. And then also a healthy supply of salt. Sage, my rosemary. When I'm usually cooking for myself and my wife at home, I don't usually use a scale. I just felt like since I'm making a cooking video that a bunch of people are gonna watch, I should get fancy and use a kitchen scale. Generally, I'm just eyeballing this stuff and yeah, this is usually what my eyeballing looks like. This is actually kind of an unconventional blending of seasonings, but for me, I think this is actually what brings out that, I don't know, holiday feel and flair to a goose. And we're gonna just drop her right in that roasting tray. We're gonna take our seasoning, we're gonna rub it all in there, get it up into those cavities, get it all around. When working with a goose, it's important to always wash your hands. Yeah, you just wanna get in here, and really work over those seasonings, get it under. Don't hesitate to flip the bird over, get it in the other side as well. Really get into that cavity. It's amazing to see how big and robust and just fat these birds get just off of eating the grass on our farm. The goose is objectively the most sustainable form of poultry you can raise because unlike ducks, chickens, or turkeys, 
they get most of their diet from grazing grasses and weeds and other plants. Here on our farm, after they're about four weeks old, our geese end up getting 90 to 95% of their diet by just free ranging and eating the grass that grows naturally here on our farm. And that means that even though they're a much larger bird than a duck or a chicken, they have a significantly smaller carbon footprint compared to those animals because you don't need to use a tractor to grow grains, you don't need to transport those grains, you don't need to do anything other than have plenty of fresh grass for your birds to eat. And that right there is one of the two reasons why I think more Americans should have goose in their diet. The second reason is it's just plain old delicious. So remember that effort we just put into spatchcocking our bird? Now we're gonna give it a very vulgar posture here because this is what's gonna make it cook way better than it would traditionally if it did have the back in place. And again, I like to use this curved rack and then just kind of press it on down in there. Yeah, the leg bones are gonna get a little overdone, but that's okay. They're just charring anyway, it's just bone, and we'll toss that in the stock when we're all said and done. But now you have this beautifully laid out bird here. And so what you should have been doing, which I should have told you a couple minutes ago, is setting your oven to 275 and let it get to temp. Also, don't forget to take that fat that we cut out earlier. We're gonna put it around the bird. Kind of like you're almost putting it in with like pads of butter. This fat is going to render down and we're gonna go get it later and it's gonna make for a wonderful magical liquid for cooking our side dishes. But now with the bird all dressed and ready to go, we're gonna pop open our preheated oven, slide this bad mama jama in there, and we're gonna close it up. Now the principle that we're going for here as we've put the bird into the oven is to cook it low and slow. It's gonna take a little bit of time, like probably somewhere in the neighborhood of three-ish hours or so. Now all the food safety fanatics out there are gonna tell you that you want your bird to reach 165, but we're gonna actually be watching our goose to make sure it hits about 145 because that's how I like to cook it. But I'm not saying that you should do it that way. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge, say them all. Consuming raw or undercooked meats, poultry, seafood, shellfish, organ eggs may increase your risk of foodborne illness. Now, since you guys are watching a cooking video with a farmer, I'm gonna assume that you wanna see most of the things that this farmer cooks is from his farm. And so as we prep the side dishes for our meal, what we're gonna be doing is roasting some pumpkin grown right here on the farm. As well as I got some of the last kale of the season from the garden and some garlic that we grew earlier this year. And so it's gonna be roast pumpkin, sauteed kale and garlic. We're gonna be using apples and maple syrup from our farm to make a nice sauce for our goose. But step one is gonna be to split open this pumpkin. wasn't good. In case you haven't noticed, I'm kind of a klutz in the kitchen. She said I needed to go to the emergency room. Hey, little barn cat, do you mind cleaning up those pumpkin seeds for me, sweetie? We're gonna just take a spoon and scoop out the pumpkin guts here. I like to use a New England sugar pumpkin when I'm doing this recipe because I just think they have a nice fleshy meat to them. I mean, it's basically just a squash. So we're almost doing kind of just like a roast winter squash here. Just a little bit of that pumpkin flavor, which I tend to enjoy more than say like an acorn squash or something. I would not try to do this with one of the big pumpkin I don't think they taste nearly as good. And in case you're wondering, I'll probably end up giving these pumpkin guts to my chickens. Now, I typically like to roast my vegetables on a cast iron skillet. I find that it just gives me a nice even cook. I will take some goose grease or duck grease or chicken fat even. And now I'll rub that all over my pumpkin. Since I already made a practice recipe of my goose actually earlier this week, because I didn't want to look like an idiot on camera, which I know I'm already failing at spectacularly. I actually have leftover goose fat from that meal, but you can easily reach into the oven too, and if some of it's already rendered off your bird, you can scoop it up and just kind of pour it on your pumpkins. You know, when it comes to doing any sort of roast vegetables, but particularly roast root vegetables, goose fat is just magical. Now I know for most folks, the instinct is to want to do a traditional kind of pumpkin spice of nutmeg and allspice, and cinnamon and like that sort of thing on pumpkin. But because we already have some of those flavors going with our goose, for the pumpkin, I'm actually gonna go way more traditional. And I'm just simply sprinkling some salt and pepper on this bad boy. Some folks might say it's overly bland, but I actually think it works really, really well where it lets you experience kind of that full flavor of the goose fat and the pumpkin and just let everything else kind of take a back seat. So a nice heavy dose of salt and then grind in some pepper too while you're at it just so it's not too, too bland. And toss that into the oven as well. Underneath our goose. Little known fact, you don't actually need a pond to raise ducks and geese. They're perfectly content if you only give them swimming pools.
how do you like them apples, huh? These things were actually picked right here on our farm. And what I'm gonna do is just really quickly peel them up. You know, apples grow like weeds here on our farm. Actually apples and pumpkins. And so when you think about where you live, you know, for us here in Vermont, dishes that have pumpkins, dishes that have apples, those are so great because they're good wintertime foods. Both apples and pumpkins store really well into the winter. And so you can still experience your farm's harvest long into the off season. What I'll also say is I'm gonna be using some of our homemade apple cider vinegar along with it to give it some acidity as well as maple syrup from our farm too to add that sweetness. And there's a secret ingredient that I'm gonna to get to in just a moment. Now you could probably make this recipe without peeling your apples, but hey, I'm trying to do something fancy here today. And so I'm going through that extra effort for you guys. And don't worry, these apple skins won't go to waste. They're gonna go into my little bucket for the chickens and let them enjoy it. And we're just gonna cut around the core of the apple because we don't wanna put that in our sauce. I'm also gonna take these apple cores and put them in my chicken bucket. I know some people are gonna say, don't do that, you're gonna kill your chickens because there's cyanide in apple seeds. Good, I'm glad. There is not nearly enough cyanide to kill a chicken in four tiny little apple cores. Now what we're gonna do here though is we're gonna chop these up into little small chunks. You don't want them too big. I think this is technically called a rough chop. I know so little about cooking. I've been 100% self-taught or just like watching videos on the internet. So there's probably a lot of conventional things that I just have no clue about. I didn't even really get into cooking much at all until a couple of years ago when I moved out to the farm and I started making kind of ingredients and I wanted to like try doing stuff with those ingredients. When you live in the middle of nowhere, your culinary options shrink drastically. And so when I was living in the city, it was really easy to go just to a restaurant and get a great meal. Now it's a lot harder, but I can do a great meal at home pretty much every night. So now you're gonna take your apple chunks, toss them in the pot, and also take a couple of tablespoons of goose grease, put that in there with the apples. And then we're gonna just take our pot, pop it on the stove. I'll do it at like a medium low heat, add a little bit of salt. And now I gotta go to the root cellar to get a couple of other things that are gonna go into this dish. Yeah, our root cellar is actually not all that fancy. We just have a closet in our gym that we use to store all of our root vegetables. So we got garlic in here, we got but a bag of onions, potatoes are in there. And what I wanna do is actually take a nice good size onion as well as a head of garlic. Now this onion, you don't wanna give that to your chickens. You should never give chickens allium. So garlic and onions, I generally really avoid trying to give that to any of the animals on the farm. And with these onions, you don't wanna dice it up too small, just nice little slices like that. Now I'm gonna grab all these guys, toss them into the pot with my apples and my goose butter. And then I'm just gonna take a single clove of garlic, smash it down, just quickly chop it up. I find that I just love garlic. Allison and I fight a lot because she thinks I use too much garlic. I just, I don't know. My mom always cooked with a lot of garlic. And so culturally, I don't know, it was just one of those things that kind of carried over for me. I'm like uh, Italian on my mom's side and Jewish on my dad's side. So I just feel like garlic's in my blood, basically. Get all that garlic up, toss that into our concoction as well. And then I'm gonna take a shot of apple cider vinegar, but I'm gonna toss it into my concoction. Then we're covering this guy up and just let it do its magic. Take four more cloves of garlic, break them up. All right, so I'm gonna just take these and dice up that garlic. I know there's gonna be so many people who are probably gonna cringe at my knife technique. I just find this is like the fastest, most efficient way to get the chunks that I need, even though they're not gonna be the most uniform. But yes, in case you're wondering, I am a vampire killer. Not to be confused with ghost face killer. I can't cope with the pressure, settling for lesser. The guard left lessons on my dresser. Do you guys think ghost face killer, like that name is supposed to mean that he's like a killer of ghosts or he's like a ghost that kills. Like, I, I've always been confused by that one. So when we were planting the orchard here on our farm, we dug these trenches or swales to capture water to provide water for the trees as well as swimming habitat for our ducks and geese. But that little duck right there, his name is Ralph and he brings me so much joy. How's it going, Ralphie? During the summer months, the ducks and geese on our farm free range in this permaculture orchard that we've set up. We don't lock them up even at night we have two livestock guardian dogs that patrol the area and keep the coyotes and bobcats and other critters away. Toby, what you doing? You going after voles? And now we're gonna take our kale Cut off the stems of that kale. Now people are gonna probably cringe at this part too because I waste a lot of kale, but we grow so much kale here on this farm. I feel like I have kale to waste and I have no guilt with that. And so all I'm doing is just trying to 
get the good stuff off the stem. And we can always take the extra kale that we have and the extra kale stems, and that's going to the chickens. Give it a good rough chop just so you don't have gigantic honking pieces. Now we're gonna use this pot, which is probably the most useful pot we have here at the farm. Pop it on the stove. Now this is gonna be one of those few non-farm ingredients with some olive oil in the base of the pan. And we're gonna take our garlic, toss that in there. Get a good stir. Once the pot reaches temp, I will turn down the heat just a little bit and then just toss in the kale. Now, if I was doing this recipe like I was originally taught, I would have used lemon juice, but I'm gonna substitute that for apple cider vinegar. Because again, I'm trying to use as many ingredients from the farm as possible. Give that another good healthy stir. Cover it up with the pot. And now it's time for a secret ingredient for our sauce. So yes, these are hot peppers that Allison grew in her garden. I'm just gonna chop it up a bit. They're spicy, they're not crazy spicy, but they're nice hot. They actually have a nice little smoky flavor to them. For me, there's nothing better than a nice sauce that's both sweet and spicy at the same time. Give my sauce a good stir and add our hot peppers. We're gonna cover it up. Hey, chicky, chicky, chickies. Hey, Toby Dog. You need to investigate? I don't think you're gonna want any of this. I got a surprise for you, chickens. Here, right, we're just gonna drop this down right here. So it's now been nearly two hours later. Let's check and see what we got going on. First order of business is let's check on our bird and see how that's cooking. Ooh, that's smelling really good. It smells like Christmas up here, that's for sure. What we're gonna wanna do is take our thermometer and check to see what our temp's gonna look like. We're at about 140, which is exactly where I wanna be. You know, like I said, I'm shooting for like 145-ish or so. And now since we're very close to temp, I'm actually gonna turn the oven temperature up to 500 degrees. You don't want your oven to come up to temp with the bird bird inside of there because what's going to happen is it's going to burn it and it's going to overcook it and it's going to get all dried out. So what you want to do is just let it sit and rest in the roasting pan in the rack. Give it like the 10 minutes or so that it's going to take for the oven to get up to temp. But don't forget to leave your pumpkin still inside of there because you're going to actually let that still go as part of the roasting process. Now let's check on our special sauce. Oh, did you look at that? That looks great. The apples have boiled down to almost applesauce. Make sure we're still at a very low temp here. Even though it's kind of congealed into a sauce, we still have one more ingredient to add. That additional ingredient is maple syrup from our farm. So because we're in Vermont and maple syrup is essentially a religion here in Vermont, we tap our maple trees every spring, we collect the sap, we boil it down in an evaporator, and then it gives us all this good maple syrup that we need for a year. And so to make this sauce, I usually take about four ounces of maple syrup and I'll dump it in at the very end. This is gonna be the sweetness. I actually think that the sugars from the maple syrup have a higher risk of burning while you're doing the slow cook of this. And so I usually wait for the, like the last, I don't know, 15 minutes or so before I put that maple syrup in. And you can leave it uncovered once you put the maple syrup in as well. That'll give it a chance to let some of that water evaporate off. So now as our onion continues to get up to temp, what we're gonna do with our goosey here is we're gonna take some of that lovely goose grease that formed at the bottom of the pan, baste that goose with that goose grease. Pop open that oven, pull out your pumpkin because your oven has now hit temp and that's ready to go. And you're gonna pop in your goose. Hey, Alexa, set an alarm for seven minutes. Seven minutes later. All right, let's pull our bird out. Ooh, now you can see it. Now I know you're gonna wanna carve up this bird immediately because it smells just so gosh darn good in here, but wait about 20 minutes or so for it to cool down. Don't worry about the bird getting cold. What's gonna happen is the meat's just gonna cool down and some of those juices are gonna settle inside the bird. If you cut it too soon, it's gonna dry out too quick. So right here you can see we have a fresh duck egg. The ducks lay their eggs pretty much year round, taking a short break in the darkest days of winter. Geese lay eggs as well. Their eggs are probably almost two, two and a half times the size of a duck egg like this. And a goose egg is roughly four times the size of a chicken egg. Goose eggs are very tasty to eat, but they're kind of rare because in our climate, geese usually only lay their eggs between February and May or June, and then that's it for the year. And so most of the eggs that we get on our farm we'll hatch those eggs out to raise goslings, which we then 
either sell to people who want geese or they end up as a goose on the dinner table. Now, while you're waiting for your goose to cool, another really important step that you can do is to take a mason jar, get a strainer, and then you're gonna wanna take your roasting pan. There's all this good stuff, like all that fat. You see that? All that is liquid gold. You can use this for cooking immediately or typically what I'll do is I'll just cover it up and put it in the refrigerator and then use it for future meals. I would also strongly suggest deglazing the pan and you can use that for other cooking adventures. Or if you weren't making an applesauce like I'm making for my goose, you can use this stuff to make gravy. But yeah, now I have a warm, savory goose grease. And like I said, this stuff works magic on root vegetables. But yes, my goose is now cooked and it's ready for carving. And so let's get down to business. I like to do a goose in the traditional cuts. If you wanna see actually the real magic of a goose and why it's so different than really any other type of poultry, maybe than other than duck, just look at that. You can see the meat, but you can also see that thick layer of skin and fat. I find that goose is almost like as luxurious as like a good steak with like really good marbling. Would you look at that tray of meat? This is gonna make for a wonderful meal. Please allow me to make up a plate for you guys. Get a piece of our pumpkin here. We'll add some of that garlicky kale. And now the star of our show. Of course, you can't forget the applesauce. Oh yeah. Enjoy your supper, my friends. And by the way, if you wanna learn more about the geese that we raise, you can watch this video right here. Thanks for watching, everybody.